The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Chapter the studio one. was filled with the, the soul intense in smell the of roses. And when the gentle summer wind moved through the trees in the garden, the strong essence of lilac entered the room. In the corner, spread out over a divan and smoking one cigarette after another, Lord Henry Wotton contemplated the new honey-coloured flowers. In the middle of the room, on an easel, was the life-sized portrait of a young man of extraordinary beauty, and standing in front of it, a little further away, the painter Basil Hullwood was sitting, admiring the painting. This is your best work, Basil. It's the best you've done, Lord Henry told the painter. Next year you must send it to the Grosvenor exhibition. I don't think so, replied the painter. I will never send this anywhere. Lord Henry raised his eyebrows and looked with astonishment through the blue smoke of the opium cigarette. And why ever not, my dear friend? Painters are such strange people. They seek fame and then don't want it. It's absurd. It's crazy because there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. I know you're going to laugh, replied the painter, but really... I can't exhibit the painting. There's too much of myself in it. Lord Henry laughed. I don't mind you laughing, said Basil. But it is nothing like you. You are an intelligent man, but intelligence has nothing to do with beauty. I'm sure that your mysterious young friend never thinks. He's a beautiful, brainless creature. You are nothing like each other. You don't understand me, replied the painter. I already know that Dorian Gray and I are nothing alike. Dorian Gray? Is that his name? asked Lord Henry. Yes, that's his name. I didn't want you to know. Why not? Because when I like someone a lot, I don't tell their name. For me, it's betrayal. I love secrecy. When I leave this city... I don't tell anyone where I'm going. It is a bad habit, I know, but in that way, life is like a novel. You must think I'm mad. No, my dear Basil, said Lord Henry. Remember that I am married, and the only delight to be had in a marriage is that the partners cheat regularly. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. I don't like you speaking like that replied Basil Halward as he walked towards the door that led to the garden. I believe that you are a good husband. You are a great person. Your shamelessness is just a front. The two men walked together towards the garden and sat on a bench under the shade of the trees. Moments later, Lord Henry looked at his watch. I must go, Basil, he said quietly, but before I go... I would like to know why you don't want to exhibit the picture of Dorian Gray. I repeat, it scares me to show the secret of my soul through a picture. And what is it? I'm going to tell you. I'm listening to you, Basil. This is the story, said the painter. Two months ago, I went to a meeting at Lady Brandon's house. I was in the drawing room, talking to various old ladies, when I felt someone looking at me. I turned and saw, for the first time, Dorian Gray. Our eyes met, and I was scared. I knew instantly that he was fascinating. I felt that something terrible was going to happen to me. I froze and wanted to leave the room. I ran towards the door, but Lady Brandon wouldn't leave me. Suddenly, I found myself face to face with Dorian Gray. We were almost touching. We made eye contact. Then I asked Lady Brandon to introduce us. And what did Lady Brandon say of this marvellous young man? 
She said that he was charming. She said that she was a close friend of his mother and that she'd forgotten what he did. Dorian Gray and I both laughed and suddenly we became friends. It's a good start, said Lord Henry. Basil turned his head. You don't understand what friendship is, Harry, he murmured, nor what is enmity. You love everybody, which is the same as not loving anybody. That's not fair, said Lord Henry. I know the difference between people. I choose my best friends by their good looks, my colleagues by their personalities, and my enemies by their intelligence. I don't have stupid enemies. Let's speak about Dorian Gray. Do you see him often? I see him every day. I must see him every day. I wouldn't be happy if I didn't see him. Amazing. I must meet Dorian Gray. Then Basil Halward got up and walked around the garden. A few moments later, he returned. He is my art, said the painter seriously. I know that my work, since I met Dorian Gray, is the best I've ever done. The simple presence of this young man, he is little over twenty years old, makes one see things in another light, I think in a different way. Tell me, does Dorian Gray affect you so much? Yes, he replied after a silence. I know he likes me. He's charming with me, and we talk for days in the studio, although at times it seems that he enjoys hurting me. I think I've given my soul to a person who doesn't appreciate it enough. My dear friend, now I remember. Remember what, Harry? Where I heard the name Dorian Gray. Where? asked the painter, a little angry. Don't look at me like that, Basil. It was at my Aunt Agatha's house. She told me that she'd met a marvellous young man called Dorian Gray. She didn't tell me that he was beautiful. She told me that he was very serious and was good-natured. I imagined a person with glasses, spots and enormous feet. I don't want you to meet him, said Basil. You don't want me to meet him? No. Mr Dorian Gray is in the studio, sir, said the butler, coming into the garden. Well, now you will have to introduce him to me, said Lord Henry, laughing. Basil Halward looked at Lord Henry. Dorian Gray is my dear friend, he said. He has a pure and simple nature. Don't corrupt him. You will be a bad influence. The world is big and there are many interesting people. Don't take him away from me. My life as an artist depends on him. Please take it into account. I confide in you. Don't talk rubbish, replied Lord Henry, who took Howard by the arm and led him into the house. Chapter 2 Lord Henry's Influence When they entered, they saw Dorian Gray. He was sitting at the piano, with his back to them, turning the pages of a score. You must lend it to me, Basil, he exclaimed. I want to learn to play. It's charming. That depends on how you pose today, Dorian. I'm tired of posing, replied the young man, turning round on the piano stool. Seeing Lord Henry, he blushed. Excuse me, Basil, but I didn't know there was someone else with you. Let me introduce you to Lord Henry Watton, Dorian, an old friend. Lord Henry extended his hand. He looked at him. Yes, effectively, he was extraordinarily beautiful, with his sincere blue eyes and curly hair. He seemed to be a trustworthy person. It wasn't strange that Basil Halward adored him. 
the painter started to prepare himself to retake the picture of Dorian Gray. You don't mind if I stay, do you, Basil? said Lord Henry. It's good for your model to have someone to talk to. If Dorian wishes for you to stay, you may stay. I never speak when I paint. It must be very boring for the models. You, Dorian, don't move too much and don't pay attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence on all my friends. Is it true? asked Dorian Gray. Good influence doesn't exist, replied Lord Henry. Why? Because it isn't good to allow people to have their own ideas. The objective in life is personal development. But today people are afraid of themselves. A new expression appeared on Dorian Gray's face. The only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it, continued Lord Henry. I'm sure that you have had passions that have frightened you, thoughts that have scared you, and dreams that have shamed you. I don't know what to say. Don't speak. Let me think, stammered Dorian Gray. Lord Henry looked at Dorian. He knew that it was the moment to be quiet. He was surprised at the young man's reaction to his words. Basil, I'm tired of standing, said Dorian. I must go out to the garden and sit down. It's very hot in here. My dear friend, I'm sorry. When I am painting, I can't think about anything else. You have posed better than ever. I don't know what Harry has said, but he made you have a marvellous expression. Don't believe a word he says. I don't believe anything he says, replied Dorian. You know you have believed it all, said Lord Henry. I will also go out to the garden. It's terribly hot in the studio. I will meet you both later, said Basil, who continued to paint the portrait. It's going to be my masterpiece, he confirmed. Lord Henry went out into the garden and found Dorian inhaling the scent of the flowers. Lord Henry approached him and put his hand on Dorian's shoulder. Cure your soul through the senses and the senses through the soul. That is one of life's big secrets, said Lord Henry. Dorian Gray turned his head. He liked this tall and elegant man. His voice was fascinating. But at the same time, he was scared and ashamed of feeling frightened. How had a stranger discovered his own self? Let's sit in the shade, said Lord Henry. I don't want you to burn your skin. It doesn't matter, said Dorian Gray, laughing. It should matter to you, said Lord Henry. Why? Because you are young, and being young is marvellous. One day you will be old and ugly, and you will have wrinkles. Now everyone likes you, but it won't always be like that. The gods have been good to you, Mr Grey, but what the gods give, they also take away. You hardly have any time to live the truth. When youth ends, beauty will end too. Enjoy your youth while you can. Look for new sensations. Don't be afraid of anything. Youth. Youth. Dorian Gray listened with his eyes wide open. Suddenly, Basil called them to return to the studio. They stood up and went there together. The painter looked at Dorian Gray for a good while and later, for a long time, at the picture. It's finished, he exclaimed finally, and he wrote his name in the corner of the canvas. Lord Henry approached and examined the portrait. My dear friend, I congratulate you, he said. 
It's the best portrait of our time. Mr Grey, come and look for yourself. Dorian didn't reply, but walked indifferently in front of the picture and turned towards it. An expression of joy appeared in his eyes, as if he recognised himself. He stood motionless and marvelled at his own beauty. Then he thought about what Lord Henry had said. One day he would stop being beautiful. Don't you like it? asked Hallward. How sad, murmured Dorian Gray, looking at the portrait. How sad. I will become old, horrible, hideous. But this picture will always be young. If only I were young forever and the picture became old. I would give my soul for it. I don't think Basil would like it, said Lord Henry. Of course not, said Hallward. Dorian Gray turned. I'm sure, Basil, you like your art more than your friends. The painter looked at him in awe. He didn't think Dorian would speak like that. What had happened? He seemed very angry. Dorian, Dorian, he exclaimed. Don't speak that way. This is your doing, Harry, said the painter. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. It is the real Dorian Gray, that is all. No, it isn't. I hate this portrait and I'm going to destroy it, said the painter. No, Basil, don't do it, exclaimed Dorian Gray. I am glad you appreciate my work at last, Dorian, said the painter. Appreciate it? It fascinates me. It's a part of me. I am sorry. Good. As soon as it's dry, I'll send it to your house. Then you can do what you want with it. Let's go to the theatre tonight, suggested Lord Henry. I can't, really. I have a lot of work to do, said the painter. Well, in that case, you and I will go alone, Mr Grey. With pleasure, said Dorian. The painter bit his lip and approached the picture. I will stay with the real Dorian, he said sadly. Am I really like that, said the young man. Yes, exactly like that. Don't go to the theatre tonight, Dorian, said Hallward. Stay and have dinner with me. I can't, Basil. Why not? Because I've promised to go with Lord Henry Wotton. He won't like you more for keeping your promises. He always breaks his. I beg you not to go. I must go, replied the young man. Chapter 3 Who is Dorian Gray? At 12.30 the following day, Lord Henry Wotton went to visit his uncle, the old, great and rather brusque bachelor. Some people said he was selfish because they never got anything out of him. In reality, he was generous and fed the people who entertained him. When Lord Henry entered the room, he found his uncle sitting, smoking a cigarette and grumbling about something the Times had published. What are you doing here so early, Harry? I thought that dandies didn't get up until two o'clock and didn't appear in public until five. I want something from you, Uncle. Money, I imagine. Mm, I don't want money. Only the people that pay their bills need money, Uncle George. And I never pay my bills. What I want is information about Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray? Who is he? asked the old man. He's the grandson of Lord Kelso and son of Lady Margaret Devereux. Grandson of Kelso, the old man repeated. Yes, I knew his mother very well. She was a beautiful young woman. She drove men mad, but she escaped with a young chap with no money. They killed him in a duel a few months after the wedding. A very ugly matter. The girl died a year later. He left a son, yes, 
I'd forgotten that. If he looks like his mother, he should be very handsome. He is very handsome, said Lord Henry. His grandfather and his mother had money. He will have inherited it. I don't know. I suppose so. He hasn't come of age yet. You say that his mother was very beautiful. One of the loveliest creatures I've seen, Harry. She could have chosen any man, but she was a romantic. Where are you eating today, Harry? At Aunt Agatha's house. Mr Grey will also be there. Lord Henry said goodbye and left his uncle's house. As he walked, he thought about the extraordinary story of Dorian Gray's mother. When he entered his aunt Agatha's house, the servant told him that lunch had already started. He left his hat and entered the dining room. Late as usual, Harry, exclaimed his aunt. He invented an excuse, sat down and looked around to see the guests. Dorian gestured to him shyly from the other end of the table and blushed. Of course, Harry, I'm very angry with you, exclaimed Lady Agatha. Why don't you want Dorian Gray to play at a charity concert? Because I want him to play for me, said Lord Henry, who looked at Dorian Gray and saw the sparkle in his eyes. Those poor people need it, protested Lady Agatha. I'm capable of sympathising with anything except suffering said Lord Henry. It's too ugly. We shall be interested in colour, in beauty and in the joy of living. It pleases me to hear you say that, said the Duchess of Harley, who was sitting in front. I always feel very guilty when I come to visit your dear aunt. The poor don't interest me. Now I can look you in the face without blushing. Ah, I would like to know how to become young again, she exclaimed. Lord Henry thought for a few seconds. Do you remember a past mistake, Duchess? He asked, looking at her from the other side of the table. Many, she exclaimed. Well, commit them again. To become young again, one must repeat the same madness. I will do it exclaimed the Duchess. A dangerous theory, said another of the guests. Yes, said Lord Henry, it is one of life's great secrets. Most people discover too late that the only thing we don't lament are our mistakes. The guests laughed. He felt Dorian Gray's eyes staring at him. This cheered him. It was brilliant, fantastic, irresponsible. Dorian Gray seemed enchanted. When he finished his speech, Lord Henry laughed and stood up. I'm going to the park, he said. As he was going out of the door, Dorian Gray touched him on the arm. Let me go with you, he murmured. I thought you'd promised Basil that you would go to the studio, replied Lord Henry. I prefer to go with you. Do you promise you'll talk the whole time? Nobody talks as well as you. Ah, I've talked a lot today, said Lord Henry, smiling. Now I want to look at life. If you want, you could come and look at it with me. Chapter Four The Young Man Falls in Love One month later, Dorian was in the small library of Lord Henry's house, who still hadn't arrived home. The young man seemed to be of ill humour and once or twice thought of going. Suddenly, he heard footsteps and he opened the door. How late you are, he murmured. I'm afraid I'm not Harry, Mr Grey, replied a shrill voice. I beg your pardon, I thought... You thought I was my husband. I'm just his wife. Let me introduce myself. I know you well. I saw you with him at the opera. 
She laughed nervously as she talked. She was called Victoria. She was an ordinary woman and seemed dishevelled. It was Wagner, no? Yes, I like Wagner's music more than any other. It's so loud that one can talk without being heard. That's a great advantage, don't you think, Mr Grey? Dorian smiled and shook his head. I'm afraid I don't agree with you, Lady Henry. I never talk when music is played, at least if it's good music. Ah, that's one of Harry's ideas, isn't it, Mr Grey? You mustn't think that I don't like good music. I adore it, but it makes me too romantic. Simply, I've had a passion for pianists. They're intelligent. But here is Harry. Harry, I came to find you and found Mr Grey. I'm very happy to have seen him. I apologise for arriving late, Dorian. I went to look for a piece of old brocade and had to negotiate for hours for it. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. I'm afraid I must go, exclaimed Lady Henry with her crazy laugh. Goodbye, Mr Grey. Goodbye, Harry. I suppose you're eating out. Me too. I imagine so, my dear, said Lord Henry, closing the door behind her. Then he lit a cigarette and fell onto the sofa. Don't get married, Dorian. Men marry because they are tired. Women marry because they are curious. Both end up disappointed. I'm too much in love, Harry. Who have you fallen in love with? asked Lord Henry. With an actress, said Dorian Gray. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. That's rather common. Who is she? She's called Sybil Vane. I have never heard anyone speaking about her. Nobody has, but everyone will one day. She's a genius. How long ago did you meet her? Three weeks ago. Where did you come across her? I'm going to tell you, Harry. For days after I met you, I felt something special inside me. One evening, around seven o'clock, I decided to go out to search for adventure. I felt that London had something in store for me. The danger gave me a sense of pleasure. Around 8.30, I passed in front of a small theatre. A hideous man was in the entrance, smoking a cigarette, and he invited me to go in. You're going to laugh at me, I know, but I went in. If I hadn't done it, my dear Henry, I would have missed the greatest love story of my life. I see that you're laughing. I'm not laughing at you. Well, I went in and sat down. The place was vulgar and very depressing. I looked at the programme and saw that they were doing Romeo and Juliet. I was interested. They raised the curtain and the play started. Romeo was a stocky, elderly gentleman. But Juliet... Imagine a girl hardly 17 years old, with the face of a flower, dark brown hair, passionate eyes and lips like rose petals. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Common women are different, but an actress. Why didn't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Because I've loved many, Dorian. And now, tell me, what are your actual relations with Sybil Vane? Dorian stood up. Harry, Sybil Vane is sacred. Why are you angry? At least you will have talked to her. I didn't speak to her until the third night. She's so shy and delicate. There is something childlike in her. She decided to call me Prince Charming. I am going to see her act every night. And what are you thinking of doing? I want Basil and you to come with me to see her act. 
Good. Which night shall we go? We will go tomorrow. She's playing Juliet tomorrow. Of course. I must go. She is waiting for me. When he left the room, Lord Henry closed his eyes and started to think about what had happened with Dorian Gray. Shortly after, his servant advised him that he should get dressed to go out for dinner. When he returned home, at around 12.30, he saw a telegram on the table in the hall. It was from Dorian Gray. It announced that he was going to marry Sybil Vane. Chapter 5 The Oath Mother, mother, I'm so happy, whispered the girl. I'm so happy, she repeated, and you must be too. Mrs Vane put her slim hands on her daughter's head. I am happy, Sybil, when I see you act. You mustn't think about anything else than your acting. Mr Isaacs has been very good to us, and we owe him money. Money, mother? she exclaimed. What does money matter? Love is more important than money. Mr Isaacs has lent us fifty pounds to pay our debts, you mustn't forget that, Sybil. Sybil Vane turned her head and laughed. We don't need it now, Mother. Prince Charming has entered into our lives. I love him, she said. Daughter of mine, you're too young to fall in love. Furthermore, what do you know about this young man? You don't even know his name. However, if he is rich... Mother, mother, let me be happy. At that moment, the door opened and a young man entered the room. He was stocky, had big feet, and his hands moved clumsily. He didn't have the tenderness of his sister and looked nothing like her. You could save some of your kisses for me, Sybil, said the young man. But you don't like people kissing you, Jim she exclaimed and crossed the room, running to hug him. James Vane contemplated his sister's face affectionately. Come for a walk with me, Sybil. I leave tonight and I don't think I'll ever return to this horrible London. Son of mine, don't say such horrible things, said Mrs Vane. Why not, mother? It's what I think. It hurts me, son. I think you will return from Australia a rich man. I only want to earn enough money so that you and Sybil can leave the theatre. I hate it. Jim, said Sybil, laughing. Do you really want to go for a walk with me? That will be lovely. Where shall we go? Let's go to the park. I'm not dressed well enough, he answered. Only elegant people go to the park. Rubbish, Jim, said Sybil, stroking the sleeve of his coat. He dithered for a moment. Very well, he said finally, but don't take long to get dressed. She went out of the door, dancing. He walked up and down the room two or three times. After, he walked towards his mother. Are my things ready, mother? Everything is prepared, James, she replied. I beg you to look after Sybil. Don't let anything bad happen to her. You must look after her mother, said James. Of course I will look after Sybil. I've heard that there is a gentleman who goes to the theatre every night and speaks to her afterwards. Is it true? It seems that the young man is a gentleman, and is also rich, replied his mother. However, you don't know his name, said the young man firmly. No, replied his mother. He still hasn't given his real name, and I think it is very romantic. James Vane bit his lips. Look after Sybil, mother, he exclaimed. Look after her. If that gentleman is rich... There is no reason not to marry him. 
They would make a charming couple. He's a very handsome man. Everyone says so. At that moment, the door opened and Sybil ran in. How serious you are, she exclaimed. What's happened? Nothing, he replied. I suppose that sometimes we must be serious. See you later, Mother. I will have dinner at five o'clock. My things are ready, so you needn't worry. See you later, son, she replied. When they got to the park, Jim asked Sybil, I have heard that you have a new friend. Who is he? Why haven't you told me about him? You don't even know his name. He's called Prince Charming. Don't you like it? Come on, don't be stupid. If you saw him, you'd think he was the most marvellous person in the world. One day you will meet him. When you return from Australia, he will like you a lot. He likes everyone, and I... I love him. I would like you to come to the theatre tonight. He will be there, and I am going to play Juliet. I want you to be careful with him. If he ever hurts you, I will kill him said the young man. How can you say such horrible things? You don't know what you're saying. You're simply jealous and cruel. I am 16 years old, he replied, and I know what I am saying. Chapter 6 Wedding Plans I imagine you've heard the news, Basil said Lord Henry to Halward one night in a small private room at the Bristol. No, Harry, replied the artist. What is it about? Dorian Gray is getting married, said Lord Henry. Dorian is getting married, he exclaimed. Impossible. It's absolutely true. Who to? To an unknown actress. I can't believe it. Dorian is rich and has good social standing. He can't marry just anyone. If you tell him that, he's sure to marry her, Basil. I hope she's a nice girl, Harry. The girl is beautiful, murmured Lord Henry. Dorian says that she's beautiful and he doesn't tend to be wrong about such matters. Are you serious? Completely serious, Basil. But do you approve of it, Henry? asked the painter. You can't possibly approve. It's just a silly infatuation. I never approve or disapprove of anything now. Dorian Gray falls in love with a beautiful young woman who plays Juliet and proposes to her. I hope that Dorian Gray makes this girl his wife passionately adores her for six months and then suddenly becomes fascinated by someone else. He would make a marvellous study. You don't believe a word you say, Harry. Lord Henry started to laugh. I believe everything I've said. But here comes Dorian. He can tell you more than me. My dear Basil, my dear Harry, you must congratulate me said the young man. I've never been so happy. He was excited and seemed extraordinarily handsome. I hope you will always be happy, Dorian, said Halward. But I won't forgive you for not telling me about your engagement. And I won't forgive you for arriving late for dinner, interrupted Lord Henry, putting his hand on the young man's back and smiling as he talked. Let's sit and you will explain to us how it all happened. Really, there's not much to tell, said Dorian, as they sat around the small round table. After I left Harry yesterday evening, I dressed, had dinner in a small Italian restaurant, and at eight o'clock went down to the theatre. When the performance finished, I went to speak to her. While we were sitting next to each other, I saw in her eyes a look I'd never seen before. We kissed. Her whole body shook 
Later she knelt and kissed my hands. Of course, our engagement is a secret. She still hasn't told her mother. At what point did you propose to her? How did she reply? asked Lord Henry. I told her that I loved her, and she told me that she wasn't worthy of being my wife. That she wasn't worthy. We'll go to the theatre. When you see Sybil, you will understand me. He got up and put on his coat. The painter was silent and worried. A short while later, they went out. He led them to the theatre as they had planned. When the horse and carriage stopped at the door, Basil felt he had aged several years. Chapter 7 A Cruel Expression in the Portrait For some reason, the theatre was crowded that night, and the fat manager met them at the door with a smile. After the orchestra played, Sybil Vane came onto the stage. Yes, really beautiful, thought Lord Henry. One of the most beautiful creatures he had ever seen in his life. Basil Halwood stood up and started to applaud. Dorian Gray remained seated, looking at her. Lord Henry murmured, Charming! Charming! However, Sybil's performance was different from other nights. She showed no sign of joy when her eyes met Romeo's. The few words she had to say had no life, and her voice sounded false. Dorian Gray started to become nervous. Neither of his two friends risked saying anything. She seemed to them a bad actress. Sybil's performance got worse and worse, and the audience started to shout and whistle. Lord Henry got up from his seat and put on his coat. She is very beautiful, Dorian, he said, but a very bad actress. Let's go. I'm going to stay until the play finishes, replied the young man. I'm very sad because I've wasted your time, Harry. My dear Dorian, it seems to me that Miss Vane is ill, interrupted Hulwood. We will come another night. Dorian, you mustn't stay here any more, said Lord Henry. Come to the club with Basil and me. We will smoke cigarettes and drink to Sybil Vane's beauty. What more could you want? Go, Harry, exclaimed the young man. I want to be alone. You go too, Basil. Let's go, Basil, said Lord Henry, with a strange tenderness in his voice. And the two youngsters will leave together. When the play finished, Dorian went to see Sybil. The girl was alone. Her eyes shone when she saw him. How badly I've performed tonight, Dorian, she exclaimed. Horribly, he replied. Are you ill? The young woman smiled. Don't you understand? she said. Understand what? he asked. Why well, I've performed so badly tonight. Dorian shrugged his shoulders. My friends were bored. I was bored. She seemed not to listen. She was happy. Dorian, Dorian, she exclaimed. Before I met you, I only lived for the theatre. Tonight, for the first time, I realised that Romeo was hideous, old and made up. The moonlight in the orchard was false, and the words that I spoke weren't my words. You have made me understand what love really is. My love, my love, my Prince Charming. I smiled when I heard the audience's whistles. What do they know of a love like ours? Take me far away, Dorian. Dorian fell onto the sofa. You have killed my love, he said. Astonished. She looked at him. He didn't reply. She went over to him and stroked his hair with her small fingers. She knelt and put her hands on his lips. 
he pushed them away. Yes, he exclaimed, you have killed my love. I loved you because you were marvellous, because you had genius and intellect. Now I see you are stupid. I will never see you again. I will never think about you. The girl turned pale and shook. She stood up and crossed the room towards him. She put her hand on his arm, looking into his eyes. He pushed her. Don't touch me, he shouted. She flung herself at his feet like a trampled flower. Dorian, Dorian, don't leave me, she whispered. Kiss me again, my love. Don't go away from me. Don't leave me. My brother... It doesn't matter. He didn't know what he was saying. It was a joke. Forgive me. Don't leave me. She sobbed. She shrank to the floor like a wounded creature. Dorian Gray looked down on her with his beautiful eyes. I'm going, he said finally. I don't wish to be cruel, but I can't see you again. Shortly after, Dorian Gray arrived home. He entered, crossed the library towards the bedroom, and as he opened the door, he saw the portrait that Basil Halward had painted of him. He was surprised. He approached the picture and examined it. It seemed that the face had changed a little. The expression was different. It appeared to have a touch of cruelty in the mouth. It was really strange. He opened the blind and the light illuminated the room. The strange expression on the face was still there. What had happened? Suddenly, he remembered what he had said in Basil Halward's studio the day he finished the portrait. He had wished that he could remain young and that the portrait become old. Had his wish come true? Impossible. However, the picture was there in front of him with a touch of cruelty in the mouth. Had he been cruel? It was the girl's fault, not his. He had fallen in love with her because he thought she was a great artist and she had disappointed him. He felt regret as he remembered her lying on the floor and crying. He would get back with Sybil Vane. He would marry her. He would try to cheer her up again. Poor child. He got up and hung a big screen in front of the portrait. How horrible, he murmured. Chapter 8. The Choice is Made It was later than midday when he woke up. His servant rang the little bell and entered the room with a cup of tea and some letters. Sir has slept well tonight, he said, smiling. What time is it? asked Dorian drowsily. A quarter past one, sir. How late? He sat down, and after having a few sips of tea, dealt with his letters. One of the letters was from Lord Henry. It had been delivered by hand that morning. He hesitated for a moment, and then put it to one side without reading it. He got dressed, entered the library, and sat down to have a light breakfast at a small round table near the open window. It was a marvellous day. Suddenly, he saw the screen in front of the portrait, and he jumped. Was it all true? Had the portrait really changed? It was absurd. He got up and locked the door. He wanted to be alone to contemplate the mask of his shame. Then he removed the screen and looked himself in the face. It was absolutely true. The portrait had changed, but he thought he could still rectify it. Sybil Vane could still be his wife. Suddenly, the doorbell rang and he heard Lord Henry's voice outside. I'm sorry, Dorian, said Lord Henry as he entered but you shouldn't think too much about it. Are you referring to Sybil Vane? asked the young man. Yes, of course, replied Lord Henry. It's horrible, but it wasn't your fault. Tell me, did you go to see her after the play finished? 
Yes, I was sure. I was brutal, Harry. Terribly brutal. But now everything is fine. I don't regret anything that happened. It has taught me to know myself better. Ah, Dorian, I am pleased that you're dealing with it this way. I am happy. I want to be good. I can't bear the idea that my soul is horrible. I will marry Sybil Vane. Marry Sybil Vane? exclaimed Lord Henry, standing up. Haven't you received my letter? Your letter? Ah, oh, yes. No, I haven't read it yet, Harry. So you know nothing. What are you trying to say? Lord Henry crossed the room, and sitting next to Dorian Gray, he took his hands and squeezed them tightly. Dorian, Sybil Vane has died. Died? Sybil is dead? It isn't true. It's a horrible lie. How dare you say that? It's completely true, Dorian, said Lord Henry gravely. They found her last night in the theatre. It seemed that she took something. I have killed Sybil Vane, said Dorian Gray, who got up and sat down next to Lord Henry. She will never come back to life, murmured the young man, hiding his face in his hands. She will never come back to life. She has played her last role, said Lord Henry. But it wasn't your fault. The truth is, that girl has never really lived. And so she has never really died. For you, at least, it has always been a dream. Sybil Vane was less real than Juliet. How well you know me. We are not going to speak any more about the event. I will remember this love as a wonderful experience. That is all. Forget all about it, Dorian, and come with me and my sister to the opera tonight. Yes, I think I will meet you there. I'm too tired to eat anything. So, see you later. I will see you before 9.30. When he was alone, Dorian went back to uncover the picture. No, there were no more changes in the image. The portrait knew about Sybil Vane's death before him. The cruelty around the mouth had appeared at the same moment that she died. He felt that his life choice had already been made. Eternal youth, infinite passion, secret pleasures, wild joys and wilder sins. He wanted all those things. The portrait would bear the burden of his shame and he would be saved. That was all. Chapter 9. The Painter Wants to See the Picture The following morning, when Doring was having breakfast, Basil Halwood entered the room. I'm pleased to see you, Dorian, he said gravely. I called last night and they told me you were at the opera. Of course I didn't believe it. My dear Basil, yes, I was at the opera, murmured Dorian Gray, taking a sip of white wine. You went to the opera, exclaimed Halward, speaking very slowly. You went to the opera as Sybil Vane was lying dead in some sordid place? That's enough, Basil. I won't hear it. Don't speak about horrible things. If one doesn't speak about them, they haven't happened, exclaimed Dorian, standing up brusquely. What is done is done. What has happened has happened. You call yesterday the past? Only superficial people need years to forget an emotion. A man who is master of himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be dependent on my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. Dorian, that is horrible. Something has changed you completely. You look the same as the wonderful boy I painted, but you talk as if you had no heart. What do you want, Basil? I want the Dorian Gray who posed for my portrait. Basil! You come here to console me, you find me well, 
and you become furious. I was nothing more than a schoolboy when you met me. Now I am a man. I have new passions, new thoughts, new ideas. I have changed, but you will always be my friend. Don't argue with me, Basil. I am who I am. There is nothing more to say. The painter felt strangely emotional. Very well, Dorian, he said finally, with a sad smile. I will never talk about this terrible story again. But you have to come and pose for me again. I will never pose for you again. It's impossible, exclaimed Dorian. The painter stared at him. My dear boy, what nonsense, he exclaimed. Do you mean to say that you didn't like the portrait? Where is it? I want to see it. It's the best thing I've ever done. Halward walked towards the corner of the room. A cry of terror escaped from Dorian Gray's lips, who ran between the painter and the screen. Basil, he said, you must not look at it. I don't want you to see it. Not look at my own work? Why not? asked Halward, laughing. If you try to look at it, I will never speak to you again for as long as I live. Halward was amazed. Dorian, but what is the matter? It is absurd that I can't look at my own work, especially as I want to exhibit it in Paris in autumn. Exhibit it? You want to exhibit it? exclaimed Dorian Gray, terrified. Yes, I suppose you won't mind. The portrait will only be away for a month. Dorian Gray passed his hand over his forehead. He was sweating. One month ago you told me you would never exhibit it, he exclaimed. Why have you changed your mind? Then Dorian Gray remembered that Lord Henry had told him that Basil had asked him why he didn't want to exhibit the picture. Yes, perhaps Basil also had his secret. Basil, he said, coming quite close, looking him in the eyes. We both have a secret. Tell me yours and I will tell you mine. Why didn't you want to exhibit my portrait? The painter shuddered. I know you're going to laugh at me. From the moment I met you, my life changed. I adored you. I was jealous of each and every person you spoke to. I wanted you for myself. I was only happy when I was with you. Of course, I never wanted you to know any of this. You wouldn't have understood. When I painted, I put a lot of myself into the picture. I was scared that others would discover that I adored you. I decided that I wouldn't exhibit the portrait. Don't get angry about what I've told you, Dorian. Dorian Gray took a long breath. The colour returned to his cheeks and a smile drew itself onto his lips. The danger had passed. For now, he was safe. Can I see the portrait? said the painter. Dorian shook his head. You mustn't ask me that, Basil. I can't allow you to see it. Will you pose for me again? Impossible. I can't explain, Basil, but there is something fatal about the portrait. It has a life of its own. Goodbye. I'm sorry you won't show me the painting one more time. When he left the room, Dorian Gray smiled. Poor Basil. How little he knows of the real reason. He had to hide the portrait. He decided to ask the servant for the only key that existed for the empty room on the top floor. She handed it to him. Dorian took the painting upstairs and locked the door with a key, which he would keep himself. Now he felt saved. As he went back to his room, he saw on the beautiful wooden table the book that Lord Henry had left him. He took it and started to read. It was the strangest book that he had ever read. The story was about a young Parisian man who dedicated his life to trying all of life's pleasures. Dorian read until he could no more. Then he started to get dressed for the dinner at the club he was going to with Lord Henry to which he arrived very late. Chapter 10 
The picture gets old. Dorian doesn't. The influence of that book accompanied Dorian Gray for years. In fact, it seemed that the book told the story of his own life. But he was even more fortunate than the novel's protagonist, who was afraid of looking at mirrors because he had started to grow old. However, Dorian Gray was not afraid of mirrors, because despite his years, he conserved his extraordinary beauty and youth. Because of this, those who knew him in person and saw the purity of his face didn't believe the bad things that were said in London about his way of life. He would often arrive home after a night of excess, go up to the room where he had locked away the portrait and open the door with a key that he always carried with him. He would place himself in front of the painting that Basil Halward had painted with a mirror. The face on the canvas had an evil and aged expression. He, however, was young and beautiful. He would examine with great care the hideous wrinkles that had appeared on the forehead and mouth of the portrait. He also liked to compare his fair hands with the wrinkled hands in the picture. Sometimes, lying in the dirty bedroom of one of those taverns of ill repute that he frequented, he thought about the harm he was doing to his soul. But these moments were rare, as his curiosity about life was greater. The more he knew, the more he wanted to know. Once or twice a month, he would open the doors of his house. He would contract the best musicians of the moment. The dinners that he held and that Lord Henry helped him to organise were famous for the careful choice of guests and for the tasteful way that the table was decorated. The elegant young people that attended these meetings saw in Dorian Gray a model to imitate and would copy everything he did. Dorian Gray looked for sensations that were at the same time new and pleasant. So, for a time, he studied perfumes. Then he entered into the study of music. And another time, he became interested in the history of jewellery. All of this helped him to forget and escape from fear. The portrait locked away in the room showed the traces of his real life. He reached a point where he couldn't live too far from the portrait. He was afraid that someone would enter the room and discover it. Chapter 11. Show the Soul. It was the 9th of November, the night before his 38th birthday. Dorian Gray was returning home from Lord Henry's house, where he had had dinner. He was wearing a thick coat, as it was a cold night. Suddenly, he saw Basil Halward in the street. He felt afraid and didn't know why. He decided not to call him and he continued to walk. But Halward had seen him and ran towards him. Dorian, I have been waiting for you at your house since nine o'clock. I'm leaving for Paris by train at midnight and I was very interested in seeing you. How lucky to have come across you. Didn't you recognise me? No, my dear Basil, lied Dorian. With this fog, I don't even recognise my street. I'm sorry you have to go already. I hope you come back soon. I'm going to be away from England for six months, but as we are in front of your house, let me in for a moment. I want to talk to you. Dorian looked at him and smiled. All right, he said, but don't speak to me about anything serious. Halward turned his head, entered, and followed Dorian towards the library. My dear Dorian, said the painter, I'm afraid we must speak seriously. What about? said Dorian, as he fell into the armchair. I hope it isn't about me. Tonight I'm tired of myself. Yes, it's about you, replied Halward seriously. I only need half an hour. 
Dorian breathed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. I think you must know that in London they're saying terrible things about you, said the painter. I don't want to know anything about them. Scandals about myself don't interest me, replied the young man. They must interest you, Dorian. They say that you're vile and degraded. I don't believe these rumours. I can't believe anything bad about you. But then, why does the Duke of Berwick leave the room when you enter? Why do many gentlemen not want to go to your house? Last week I had dinner with Lord Staveley, and he told me that you shouldn't approach any young woman and that no married woman should sit next to you. Basil Halward continued talking about the horrible things they were saying in the city about Dorian Gray. Sir Henry Ashton had to leave England with his name tarnished, continued the painter. And what can you tell me about Lord Kent's only son? That's enough, Basil. You're talking about things that nobody knows, said Dorian scornfully. What do all these stories have to do with me? I know perfectly well how people in England gossip. In this country, they criticise intelligent men. England is the cradle of hypocrites. That isn't the issue, Dorian, said the painter. There are other stories. One of my best friends showed me a letter that his wife wrote before dying. Your name appeared in it. It was the worst confession I've ever read. I told my friend that I knew you and that you couldn't do these things. But now I don't know if I really know you. To get an answer, I would need to see your soul. See my soul, murmured Dorian Gray, getting up from the sofa. Yes, replied Halward painfully, but only God can do that. Then Dorian laughed mockingly. You can see it this very night, he exclaimed, taking the table lamp. It's your own work. Why should I hide it? You have talked enough about corruption. Now you can see it face to face. Yes, now I am going to show you my soul. Chapter 12 A Trapped Animal Dorian Gray left the room and started to go upstairs, followed by Basil Halward. He walked without making a noise. The lamp produced shadows on the wall and the windows shook in the wind. When they arrived, the young man opened the locked door of the room where the hidden picture was. They felt a cold draught and Dorian Gray shuddered. Close the door, he said to the painter and put the lamp on the table. Basil Halward looked at the untidy, dusty room. He seemed perplexed. So, according to you, only God can see a person's soul, said Dorian Gray. Draw back this curtain and see mine, he added in a cold and cruel voice. You're mad, replied Halward, rather angry. You don't want to. I will do it myself, said the young man, and threw to the floor the curtain that covered the picture. The painter screamed, horrified, as he saw the canvas and the hideous face. It was repugnant, it was horrible, but, my God, it was Dorian Gray's face. The horror hadn't been able to hide all that extraordinary beauty. There was still some gold in the hair and a scarlet tone to the lips. The swollen eyes still reminded one of Dorian Gray's blue eyes. The painter held the lamp to the picture. He could see his own signature in one corner. He turned and looked at Dorian Gray with his eyes wide open. The young man was leaning against the wall, looking indifferent. He had removed the flower he had been wearing on his coat and was smelling it. What does that mean? exclaimed Basil Halward. Dorian Gray crushed the flower with his hand and said, Years ago, when I was a youth, you taught me to feel proud of my beauty. At that time, just as you had finished the portrait you had painted for me, I made a wish to stay young and beautiful 
and that the picture would bear the weight and ugliness of the years. I remember it well, but it is impossible. Most certainly the damp in this room has destroyed the colours of the picture. No, Basil, it is the true face of my soul. Heavenly saints, you have the eyes of a demon. Each of us has heaven and hell in him, said Dorian. My God, is this what you have done with your life? You are worse than they say, he said. He fell onto a chair and hid his face in his hands. Dorian Gray was crying next to the window. Pray, Dorian, pray, exclaimed the painter. It is too late, Basil, said Dorian. It is never too late, Dorian. The young man looked at the picture again and suddenly felt like a trapped animal. He hated the painter more than he hated anyone in his whole life. He saw a knife that had been left on the table. He took it and walked slowly towards the painter who was sitting on the chair. It was as if the picture was pushing him to do it. When he was behind his friend, he threw himself on him and stabbed him time and time again while hitting his head against the table. The painter moaned and raised his extended arms three times and shook his hands. Dorian Gray stabbed him with a knife twice more, although the man no longer moved. Something started to drip onto the floor. He stopped and listened. It was the drip, drip of blood on the rug. He opened the door and went to the stairs. The house was silent. Nobody was in. He returned to the room and locked himself in. He didn't look at the murdered man. The man who had painted the damn portrait had gone out of his life. That was all. He sat and started to think. There was no evidence against him. Nobody had seen him enter the house with Basil Hallward. In addition, the painter had said that he was leaving for Paris by train at midnight and that he was going to be away from England for a long time. Months would pass before someone started to suspect something. Chapter 13 Destroy the Corpse At nine o'clock the following day, the butler entered Dorian's room with a cup of hot chocolate. The young man was sleeping in his bed like a child, and the man had to touch him on the shoulder twice for him to wake up. He sat up and little by little remembered what had happened that night. For a moment, he hated Basil Halward again. He thought that the dead man would still be in the room upstairs, sitting with his head on the table, as if he were asleep. He decided to write two letters. He put one in his pocket and gave the other one to his butler. Give it to Mr Campbell, he ordered, and gave him the address. When he was alone, he took a book from the shelf and started to leaf through it. He had decided not to think about what had happened while it wasn't absolutely necessary. Alan Campbell, the man he had written to, was a chemist and had his own laboratory. They had been close friends in another time. Their friendship ended suddenly, but nobody knew whether they had had an argument or not. Impatient, Dorian Gray looked at his watch every second. He got up and started walking up and down the room. Finally, the front door opened and the butler entered. Mr Campbell, announced the butler. Alan Campbell entered. He was very serious and very pale. Alan, exclaimed Dorian, I am very grateful to you for coming. I had no intention of ever stepping foot in this house again, Gray, but your butler said it was a question of life or death. His voice was hard and cold, and he looked at Dorian with contempt. Yes, it is, Alan. Sit down. Dorian sat in front of him. The two men's eyes met. After a tense silence, 
the young man leant forward and said, Alan, in a locked room in the attic, there is a dead man sitting in front of a table. He's been dead for ten hours. Don't move and don't look at me like that. Who this man is, why he has died and how he has died are matters that are not important to you. What you have to do is... Stop, Grey! I don't want to know any more. I don't care if what you've just told me is true or not. I am not interested. I'm sorry, Alan, but it will have to matter to you. You are the only person who can save me. You are scientific and you know about chemistry. What you have to do is destroy the body which is upstairs. You are mad, Dorian. I don't want anything to do with this. Do you think I'm going to risk myself for you? I won't report to you, but I don't want anything to do with this. You refuse? Yes. Dorian Gray took a piece of paper, wrote something and gave it to Campbell. The man read it and turned pale. After two or three minutes of silence, Dorian put a hand on his shoulder. I'm sorry for you, Alan, he said, but you don't leave me with an alternative. I have written a letter, and if you don't help me, I will send it. Campbell hid his face in his hands and groaned. Then he said, I will have to get a few things from my house. My butler will go. Write what you need on a piece of paper, said Dorian. The butler didn't take long to return with a large box full of chemical products. Shall I leave these things here? said the man. Yes, and you could have the rest of the afternoon off, replied Dorian. Thank you very much, sir, said the servant, and he left the room. Dorian indicated the way to the attic to Alan and accompanied him. He opened the door a little and saw the face in the portrait looking at him. He was going to cover the canvas when he saw that blood had appeared on one of the portrait's hands. That seemed worse than the image of the murdered man. He quickly entered the room and, without looking at the dead man, covered the picture with the material. Leave me alone said Campbell in a severe voice. Five hours later, Alan Campbell returned to the library. I have done what you have asked me to do. I hope we never see each other again, he muttered. When Campbell went, Dorian Gray went up to the attic. There was a horrible smell in the room. But the corpse had disappeared. Chapter 14 what did you do last night? That evening at 8.30, Dorian Gray walked into the drawing room of Old Lady Narborough's house. He was very well dressed. He was very nervous, but his manners were as graceful and natural as ever. Perhaps it is never as easy to be oneself as it is to act a role. Looking at him, nobody would have imagined what had just happened in his house. And he, for a few moments, felt the pleasure of a double life. Lady Narborough was a very intelligent woman and also notably ugly. She had proved to be an excellent wife to a boring ambassador who had since died. After having married off her daughters to rich old men, she enjoyed the pleasures of French fiction, French cuisine and even French spirit. The guests at the meeting were rather boring, and Lady Narborough asked Dorian Gray to sit next to her. He was regretting having come, although he was pleased to know that Lord Henry Wotton had also been invited. So, when the door opened and he heard his soft, melodic voice, he stopped feeling bored. But at dinner he couldn't eat anything. He didn't try any of the dishes, and Lady Narborough didn't stop scolding him. Lord Henry was also surprised by his silence and distance. The young man drank champagne eagerly, but he became thirstier and thirstier. Dorian, said Lord Henry, what is the matter? 
You seem distant. I think he's in love, exclaimed Lady Narborough, and is afraid of telling me in case I was jealous. And he's right, I would be. My dear Lady Narborough, whispered Dorian, smiling, I haven't fallen in love for a week. You should ask Dorian about Madame de Ferrol, the little duchess. He's one of her most intimate friends, said Lord Henry, looking at Lady Narborough. Lord Henry, it doesn't surprise me that everyone says you are extraordinarily evil, said the old lady. Lord Henry pretended to be serious and said, It's intolerable the way people say things behind my back that are totally true. Lord Henry, you are very perverse, and I at times would love to be perverse too. But you, Dorian, are made to be good. You look so good. I would like to find you a lovely wife. Lord Henry, don't you think that Mr Grey should get married? It would have to be a suitable marriage, so that they were both happy, said the old lady. What nonsense people talk about happy marriages, exclaimed Lord Henry. A man can be happy with a woman as long as he does not love her. Ah, how cynical you are, said Lady Narborough. You must come and have dinner with me again soon. You make me feel well, better than the medicine they prescribed me. Lord Henry smiled, turned and looked at Dorian. Do you feel better? he asked him. I am fine, tired, that is all. The little Duchess is delighted with you. She told me herself, said Lord Henry. And her husband? He bored her terribly. She's very intelligent. How long has she been married? An eternity, she says. It's certain that you left very early last night. What did you do after? Did you go straight home? Dorian looked at him, surprised. No, he said. I didn't get home until three in the morning. Did you go to the club? Yes, he replied. Then he bit his lip. No, I didn't mean that. I, I didn't go to the club. I walked. I forget what I did. You always want to know what I've been doing, exclaimed the young man angrily. My dear friend, I really don't care. But I think something happened, Dorian. You don't seem the same tonight. Ignore me. I am anxious. I must go. Once home, he took off his suit, dressed like a common man, and wrapped a scarf around his neck. He had to forget. He went out again and stopped a horse and carriage. He climbed in and gave the driver an address. It's too far for me, said the man. I will pay you well, said Dorian. All right, sir. We will be there in an hour. He confirmed, and drove the carriage in the direction of the river. Chapter 15 A Brutal Hand Tightens the Throat Rain. The taverns were closed. Horrible laughs came from a few of the bars. In others, drunkards argued and shouted. From the carriage, Dorian Gray contemplated the suburbs of the city. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion. Dens of horror where one could destroy the memory of old sins with new sins. The carriage seemed to be going slower and slower. The terrible urge for opium started to overpower him. His throat burnt and his delicate hands twitched nervously. Suddenly, the driver halted. It's about here, is it not, sir? said the man. Dorian jumped and looked around him. Leave me here, he responded. He got out and walked rapidly towards the wharf. Occasionally he looked behind him to see if someone was following him. After seven or eight minutes, he arrived at an old house. He stopped in front of the door and called with a password. The door opened and he entered in silence. He arrived at a room. The floor was dirty, the curtains broken, and in one corner he saw a sailor sprawled across a table with his head hidden in his arms. 
Next to the bar, two women were teasing an old man. The dense odour of opium hit him. He breathed deeply and trembled with pleasure. Dorian looked at various men who were lying on dirty mattresses. Their mouths were open, their gazes empty and their eyes glazed. He thought they were better than him, a prisoner of his thoughts. The memories were devouring his soul. Sometimes it seemed that Basil Halward's eyes were looking at him. He needed to escape from himself. Then the women in the bar approached him and started to talk to him, but Dorian turned his back to them. A proud man, one of them teased. Don't talk to me, exclaimed Dorian, kicking the floor with his foot. What do you want? Money? Take it. Don't talk to me again. The woman took the coins from the counter. Dorian walked towards the door and the woman said, There goes the devil's bargain. Curse you, replied Dorian. Don't call me that. Do you prefer me to call you Prince Charming? At that moment, the sailor who's flopped over the table stood up and looked wildly around him. Dorian left the den and the sailor ran after him. He reached him as he turned off towards a dark passage. The sailor threw him against the wall before Dorian could defend himself. A brutal hand tightened his throat. He fought like a madman for his life and managed to free himself from the pressure of the man's fingers, but a second later, a revolver was pointing directly at his head. What do you want? Keep quiet. If you move, I'll shoot. You're mad. What have I done to you? Destroy Sybil Vane's life. She was my sister. She committed suicide, and it is your fault. I, James Vane, swore I would kill you. I've been looking for you for years. I only knew the pet name she used to call you, Prince Charming. Make your peace with God, because you are going to die. Dorian Gray was scared to death. I, I don't know her, he stammered. I've never heard of her. You're mad. It will be the best for you to tell the truth, because you are going to die. Dorian didn't know what to say or what to do. Suddenly, an idea came to his head. Wait, he exclaimed. How long ago did your sister die? Eighteen years, replied the sailor. Eighteen years? laughed Dorian Gray. Eighteen years? Take me to the light and look at my face. The sailor hesitated for a moment, but then seized Dorian Gray and took him towards a lit area. Then he saw that he was almost a youth. He looked like a young man of little more than twenty years, about the same age as his sister when she died. He took a step back. My God! he exclaimed. Dorian Gray took a deep breath. You almost committed a terrible crime he said gravely. It would be best if you went home and put away that pistol, said Dorian, turning and walking slowly down the street. Vane stood motionless in the middle of the street. He was shaking from head to foot. After a while, a woman who had been hiding came into the light and put her hand on his arm. It was the woman from the bar. Why didn't you kill him? She whispered, you are stupid. He has a lot of money and he's a bad person. He isn't the man I'm looking for, he replied. The man I'm looking for must be around 40 and he is only a boy. A boy, she teased. He's the worst person who comes here. They say he sold his soul to the devil for a pretty face. I have known him for about 18 years. He hasn't changed since then. You swear this? I swear it. The sailor ran towards the corner of the street, but Dorian Gray had disappeared. Chapter 16 A Scream in the Conservatory One week later, Dorian Gray was sitting in the conservatory in his country house, talking to the pretty Duchess of Monmouth, who, with her husband, was one of his many guests. The Duchess's white hands moved daintily 
and her red lips smiled whenever Dorian whispered something to her. Lord Henry contemplated them. What is up to you, Lord Henry? asked the Duchess. An illness? Love? An illusion? Religion? The substitute for belief? You're a sceptic. Never. Scepticism is the beginning of faith. So what are you? To define is to limit. You confuse me. Let's talk about someone else. About Dorian. He's a delicious topic. Years ago he was christened Prince Charming. Don't remind me of that, exclaimed Dorian. Dorian is quite unbearable tonight, replied the Duchess, blushing. I believe he thinks that my husband married me simply to have the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly. Well, I hope he won't stick pins in you, laughed Dorian. No, my maid already does that when she gets angry. And why does she get angry? For the most simple things, Mr Grey, I assure you. I normally arrive at ten to nine and I tell her that I must be dressed by eight-thirty. But I can't punish her because she invents hats for me. All good hats are made out of nothing. Like all good reputations, Duchess, interrupted Lord Henry. Every triumph creates an enemy. To be popular, one must be mediocre. Not with women, said the Duchess, and women rule the world. I assure you that we don't like mediocre men. And you, Dorian, do you agree with Lord Henry? I always agree with him. Even when he's wrong? He is never wrong, Duchess. And does his way of thinking make you happy? I've never looked for happiness. I prefer pleasure. And have you found it, Mr Grey? Often, too often. The Duchess sighed. Let me bring you some orchids, Duchess, said Dorian, standing up and going towards the end of the conservatory. You are flirting disgracefully with him, said Lord Henry to the Duchess. You should take care. He is fascinating. Then a scream came from the conservatory, followed by the dull sound of a fall. All the guests jumped. The Duchess was motionless, terrified. Lord Henry ran towards the conservatory and found Dorian Gray lying face down on the floor. He had fainted. They took him to the drawing room and lay him on the sofa. When he came round, he looked around him, confused. What happened? he asked. Ah, oh, I remember. Am I safe, Harry? he asked and started to tremble. My dear Dorian, you fainted. That was all. It will be better if you don't go down to dinner. I prefer to go down. I don't want to be alone. He went up to his room to get dressed and later went down to have dinner. At the table, a feeling of horror occasionally ran through his body whenever he remembered seeing James Vane's face watching him through the conservatory window with his face pressed against the glass. Chapter 17 A Bad Omen The following day he didn't leave the house and in fact spent most of the time in his room, ill and scared to death of dying. When he closed his eyes, he saw the sailor's face through the glass again. He also thought it was just a figment of his imagination. After all, many things are only a product of our imagination. In reality, the universe doesn't punish the bad or reward the good. Also, success is for the strong and failure for the weak. That was all. Besides, someone would have noticed the presence of a stranger around the house. Without doubt, it was just his imagination. Sybil Vane's brother had not come to kill him. He didn't know his name, and besides, he was still young. After three days shut in, he decided to go for a walk, and he met the Duchess's brother. Have you had a good hunt? he asked. Not very good, Dorian. I think it will be better after lunch. Dorian walked next to him. The air, the hunter's cries and the dry sound of the shots filled him with a sense of freedom. Suddenly, a hare came out from a thicket. The Duchess's brother put the shotgun on his shoulder to shoot 
But Dorian Gray felt pity and shouted, Don't kill it, let it live. What nonsense, Dorian, laughed Sir Geoffrey, then shot. Two cries were heard, the cry of pain from the hare, which is terrible, and the cry of agony from a human being, which is even worse. God in heaven, I've caught a man! How stupid to stand in front of a shotgun, said Sir Geoffrey. The hunters walked towards the place where the scream had come from. A few minutes later, they returned, dragging a body. Dorian turned, terrified. He felt that bad luck was following him. They said that the man was dead. A hand touched his shoulder. He jumped and looked. It was Lord Henry. Is he... Dorian couldn't finish the sentence. I am afraid so, said Lord Henry. Come on, let's go home. It's a bad omen, my friend, said Dorian. It was an accident. It's inevitable. It's not our problem. It's no use talking about this matter. I believe that something horrible is going to happen to one of us. To me, maybe, he said with a gesture of pain. The only horrible thing in this world is bored, Dorian. That is the only sin there is no forgiveness for. Omens don't exist. Besides, what could happen to you? You have everything a man could desire. I want to escape, go far away, forget. Coming here was a stupid idea. I'll ask my butler to prepare the yacht. I will be safe in the yacht. Safe from what, Dorian? Do you have a problem? Tell me. I will help you. I can't tell you, he replied sadly. Dorian Gray went up to his room and lay on the sofa. He was terrified. He decided that he would leave. Then someone called at the door. It was the estate's manager. I imagine you've come about this morning's unfortunate accident, said Dorian, prepared to write him a cheque. Yes, that is so, replied the manager. Was this poor, unhappy man married? Did he have a family? We don't know who he is, sir. You don't know who he is? What does that mean? Wasn't he one of your men? No, sir. We hadn't seen him before. He looks like a sailor. Dorian felt as if his heart had stopped. Did he have something on him that tells us his name? Some money, not much, sir and a revolver. Where is the body? exclaimed Dorian. Hurry, I want to see it. In the stable, sir. Dorian arrived at the farm in less than a quarter of an hour. He ran towards the stable and entered. On top of a load of sacks, in a corner, was the corpse of a man wearing a shirt and blue trousers. Dorian walked backwards. When he saw his face, he screamed with joy. The dead man was James Vane. He returned to the house with his eyes filled with tears. He was safe. Chapter 18 An Intention to Mend One's Ways Don't say that you're going to be good, exclaimed Lord Henry. You're perfect as you are. I beg you not to change. Dorian Gray turned his head. No, my friend, I've done too many horrible things in my life. I'm not going to do any more. Yesterday I started my good action. Where were you yesterday? In the countryside. My dear boy, said Lord Henry, smiling, anyone can be good in the countryside. There are no temptations in the countryside. I'm going to change. I believe I've already changed. And what was your good action for yesterday? asked Lord Henry. I met a young woman.
extraordinarily beautiful and very similar to Sybil Vane. She's a simple village girl, but I've fallen in love. I have visited her two or three times a week in May. We had decided to leave together this morning at sunrise, but I won't do it, because I want to respect her purity. So you have broken her heart, concluded Lord Henry. Don't say that. You are horrible. She cried, of course, but she will stay pure. My dear friend, you have youthful ideas, said Lord Henry, laughing. Do you think she'll be happy with a man from the village after meeting you? You mock everything. I want to be better. You're not going to convince me that my good action is really a new sin. Forget it. Let's talk about another thing. What's happening in the city? I haven't been to the club for days. People are still talking about Basil's disappearance. I thought they'd tired of that topic, said Dorian, helping himself to a little more wine. My dear boy, they've only been talking about him for six weeks. The British can't cope with the effort of more than one topic every three months. Although this time they also have my divorce and Alan Campbell's suicide. And what are they saying about Basil? Scotland Yard insists that on the 9th of November, Basil caught the midnight train to Paris. But the French police say that Halward never arrived. And you? What do you think happened? asked Dorian with surprising calm. I haven't the slightest idea. If he has hidden himself, it's none of my business. If he has died, I don't want to think about it. Death is the only thing that terrifies me. I hate it. Why? asked Dorian, tired. Because one can survive anything except that. Death and vulgarity are the only two questions of this century that one cannot explain. But Dorian, play Chopin for me. The individual that my wife escaped with played Chopin exquisitely. I was very in love with her. Of course, I believe that my marriage was a bad habit, but we will regret the loss of even our worst habit. Has it occurred to you that Basil was murdered? asked Dorian Gray suddenly. Lord Henry yawned. For what motive? He wasn't intelligent enough to have enemies. He was a very talented painter, but a person can paint like Velasquez and be tremendously boring. What would you say if I confessed that I killed Basil? said Dorian, staring at him. That you are lying. All crime is vulgar. Crime belongs to the lower classes. Murder is always a mistake. One should never do anything that one cannot talk about during dinner. Lord Henry crossed the room and started to stroke the head of the curious parrot that was balancing on a bamboo cane. By the way, Dorian, what happened to that magnificent portrait he painted? I don't know. I never really liked it. Lord Henry looked at him with his eyes half closed. Play for me, Dorian, and while you play, tell me in a quiet voice how you have kept your youth. You must have a secret. I am only ten years older than you, but I am much more wrinkled. Ah, Dorian, what a marvellous life you have had. No one has destroyed you. You are still the same. I am not the same. Yes, you are the same. Don't destroy your life. You are perfect. Don't cheat yourself. Life is not dominated by either will or intention. I'm not going to have the same life, insisted Dorian. You don't know everything about me. If you knew, you would go. You and I will always be friends, said Lord Henry. You and I are what we are. Sorry, I'm tired tonight. It's nearly eleven o'clock and I want to get home early, said Dorian. Chapter 19 The Destruction It was a warm night. 
He didn't put on his coat or put his silk scarf around his neck. As he walked home, smoking a cigarette, he walked past two young men. He heard them whisper, That is Dorian Gray. He remembered once feeling pleasure when they pointed at him. They looked at him, or they talked about him. But now he was tired of hearing his own name. When he arrived home, the butler was waiting for him. He told him to go to bed. Sitting on the sofa in the library, he started to think about some of the things that Lord Henry had said to him. Is it true that one couldn't change? Now he regretted having wished that the portrait would bear the weight of his sins while he kept his youth. What was youth, really? A time of naivety, immaturity, a time of mood swings and ill thoughts. He took from the table the mirror that Lord Henry had given him many years ago. He looked at himself and hated his beauty. He threw the mirror onto the floor and broke it into pieces. It was best not to think about the past. Nobody could change it. He had to think about himself and his future. James Vane was buried. Alan Campbell had shot himself one night in his laboratory, but hadn't revealed his secret. People would soon forget about Basil Halward's disappearance. Basil had painted the portrait that had ruined his life. The portrait was to blame for everything. He had decided to be good and, in fact, had respected that girl from the village. He thought that maybe the picture had already started to reflect his good actions. He decided to check. He entered the room silently and locked the door. Then he pulled away the material that covered the portrait. When he saw it, he emitted a cry of pain and indignation. It hadn't changed. It was still repugnant. It was even more repugnant than before. The red stain on the hand that looked like blood was bigger and reached the fingers. There was even blood on the other hand. What did it mean? That he was going to confess? He was going to turn himself in? He started to laugh. The idea seemed monstrous. He would never confess. There was only one piece of evidence against him. The picture. He would destroy it. He looked around him and saw the knife that he had stabbed Basil Halward with. It was bright. He had killed the painter, and now he would kill his work. He would be free and at peace. He seized the knife and stabbed the portrait. A cry was heard, and the crash of a fall. The servants woke, frightened. After a while, one of them decided to go up to the room. He knocked on the door but nobody answered. He called again. Everything was silent. He tried to force the door, but couldn't, so he decided to climb up onto the roof terrace and enter via the balcony, whose window opened easily. When he entered, the servant found a marvellous portrait of his master, just as he had seen him the first time, young and beautiful. Lying on the floor, was a dead man with a knife stuck in his heart. It was the corpse of someone old, tired, full of wrinkles, with a repugnant face. He knew who the man was when he looked at his rings. <laughs>